This is The Baseline, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Welcome everybody, you're tuned to The Baseline, Cal Lee, Warren Shaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Jam-packed show we got on board with you, buckle up. We about to take that ride over to La La, where there's a lot happening in Clipper land. Man, big things are going down, and of course... I got to make sure that I roll with my other conductor on the opposite side. Roll with me hard. Brother like no other. Rolling out that red carpet for my right-hand man, 50 Grand, NBA aficionado, www.shawsports.net, Big Kahuna PNC. Mr. Warren Shaw, repping out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Holler back at me, Mr. Shaw. You living good these days, brother? I'm doing all right, man. I'm doing all right. Thanks for asking, as always. But to our fans and our listeners, Sloop Slu. Appreciate you so much for tuning in. We have a great show on top of us, an exciting, energetic guest coming on board to talk about set of LA Clippers. And, and you know, well, we're going to have a little fun too in our drop segment too, man. So I think it's going to be a great show for everybody to, to peek out and listen to. Bro. Yeah, man. Uh, listen, man, you talk about bringing that funk, man. We bring him up. We bring in a brother like no other out there uh, in the West coast, man. Uh, he's a, uh, He's definitely been on point. He's followed the Los Angeles Clippers. He's covered the Los Angeles Clippers for quite some time. He's got a new show out on Dash Radio. Our man Clipper Daryl will be joining us in a little bit to talk about what's happening with the Los Angeles Clippers. Uh, a lot of turmoil going on, and uh, I know that he's right in the heart of it, speaking truth to power about what needs to happen for the Clippers moving forward. Also, a big segment uh, we got going on, new segment in uh, of the drop. Where my man Shaw and I, we gotta we gotta check up on some of our players, man. We make sure that they good, they they all right. So uh, there's a few players that we're gonna touch on here in our segment of the drop uh, and get you all good with where they are, where where they are so far at the outset of this season. So a lot of stuff happening. Also, we got a lot of stuff to cover with injury reports and updates. So be sure to tune in with us here on the Baseline NBA podcast. We welcome those of you who are new listeners and we always show love to our old listeners as well be sure to get my man shaw astro sports nba get at me at game face lee our twitter handle at nba baseline available on all the major platforms uh you know where to go to in order to check out the baseline nba podcast never see never never say no more we're ha- we're coming to you live direct from the almighty ballers network if you want the basketball goods you want to hear about it then be, be sure to check out almighty ballers uh 24 7 basketball talk all day every day baseline NBA podcast features there. We'll also feature on the 16 Wins a Ring website. If you want the content and read the goods about everything happening in the NBA, check out 16 Wins a Ring. We are exclusive there, and we are also exclusive on the Nothing But Net uh, Nothing But Net Network via Dash Radio. Dash Radio, one of the up and coming online streaming uh, websites. So be sure to go to Dash Radio. Check out the new show uh, with our man Clipper Dow, and while you're at it, check out the Baseline NBA podcast as well too. You know how we do, and you know how we roll. It's time now for the breakdown. Time to break it down. I down to the bone gristle. Time now for the breakdown. Cal Lee, Warren Shaw of the Baseline NBA Podcast. This week, we have a special guest. I always feel like our guests are special, but this is phenomenally special. Because not only we don't, know, we don't get an opportunity to reach out to the West Coast like the, the same way that we normally do, um, but to really talk about the state of affairs that's happening with the Los Angeles Clippers, I think it's only right that we put somebody on who has been knee deep, ride or die with this franchise through the good and the bad. And even right now, as we speak about the Clippers and the bad, it can't be much worse than what they've been dealing with uh, prior to Balmer coming in, to Doc Rivers coming in. But the best person we felt like that can really give us insight on this is our man, Clipper Daryl. If you don't know who he is, uh, he is one of the more phenomenal radio personalities out there. He's got a brand new show on Dash Radio called Fan Truth. Clipper Daryl, thank you for jumping on board with us here to break down some Clippers basketball, brother. Man, thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it. Listen, I, I've been someone who's been, you know, enamored with the phenomenon now that is Lob City. Uh, the, you know, the, it, it felt like, you know, four or five years ago, the Clippers kind of went through a, a reformation project, right? Like th- this was no longer, you know, the sister basketball team to the Los Angeles Lakers or, you know, the one that, you know, that you always play pranks in elementary school on. You wait until he becomes a big boy where he shows shows you out, you know, at the high school prom. There was something different about the Los Angeles Clippers. I think that they really felt like they deserved to be on some grown man business when it comes to how they perform and play in the NBA. 
And we kept waiting and waiting and waiting for this to, to mature into something bigger and better. Like we're talking about Clippers, you know, NBA champions at some particular point. And while that hasn't materialized, mm. I feel like something more painstakingly uh, growing is happening with this, this basketball team because of what we've seen this season uh, specifically. Do, am I the only person who kind of feels that way? Or, or is that kind of like what's emanating now with the, the Clipper fan base, you know, out there from what you're seeing? I mean, I mean, we I understand about the injury situation. Uh, injuries is a part of the game, and that's when that's when coaching comes in, you know. And when you when you're a good coach, you can coach injuries. I don't I don't care who you are, you know. Pop been doing it, Kerr been doing it. Uh, you know the great that Pat, Pat Riley to you know to Red Arback, you know. Uh, it's a part of the game, but to me, when you have a structure, when you have a system and you let everybody know their roles, and you have a great rotation, and you play people in fair minutes, you, you, you have a superb team. There's 450 players in the NBA. All of them was high school and college phenoms because they wouldn't be in the NBA if they wasn't, okay? So let these guys play, play them to the best of their abilities, and, and you know, and, and move on from it. It's not, being a Clippers fan is not about winning and losing. It's about going out and competing each and every night. Wow. So you're saying, right. so, so, so wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt y'all. So you're saying that there's something more about this basketball team that's not just about the, the W's and the L's. We're talking about that we're now questioning their heart and their effort on a nightly basis with this Clippers basketball team. If I'm, if, 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 if and I hope I'm not talking out of place, but that's kind of what I'm getting from what you're saying, Clip. Now, I'm not going to say, now, the guys are playing with heart. The guys are playing with, you know, with, with, with the best of their abilities. But when you, have a, when you have a coach that doesn't believe in their bench, and when you go out there and you make a mistake and you get pulled, you go out there, you play five minutes, and all of a sudden you make a mistake on, on defense or, or even on offense, and, and you, you get taken out, you never learn because now you bench for the rest of the game. These guys have to learn. I don't care if you're a rookie. I don't care if you've been in the, in the league 10 years. It's a learning process each and every night, man. And it's a, and, and I always, you know, dictate is believe in your bench. We've had five different benches since Glenn Rivers has been there. And it, 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 it just, it's just getting so frustrating because you can't keep blaming injuries. You can't keep blaming it. If you had a system, you know what I'm saying? It's just like if, if your show, just like y'all have a show, if one of you guys don't make it, y'all can do a fill in. Y'all can do a fill in. You know, you have a structure. You tell a person, hey, this is what we're going to talk about. You want to move on. The show must go on. It ain't, you know what I'm saying? So you're going to have a great show. But people don't people don't understand that. You know what I'm saying? If everybody knows they roll on a team, it, it, it makes everything so much better. So, Clipper Darrell, you've been obviously covering the team for a very, very long time and been from super fan, if you will, to get into to the status that you kind of have now. And again, you're a, a bona fide celebrity in the LA community and, and kind of worldwide, if you will. But what you're saying here now seems to be almost a direct indictment on the on the on the management of, of, of Doc Rivers, who was at one time president. I think he's relinquished those duties now to Loris Frank. So are you saying mm -hmm. that roster construction and the way Doc Rivers has coached this this franchise has kind of led to the lack of success or uh, that next level success that a lot of people thought it should have had, and maybe to some of the problems that we're having in, in, in this upcoming season. All right, yeah, you, you took the words right out of my mouth, you know? Oh, and, and Shaw's because, been known to do that, by the way. He, he, he's been known to take <laughs> words out of people's mouths. Be careful, man. He might snatch up your seat over at your new show, so. Never that. Never that. I, got, I got respect. I got respect. Yeah, but it, it, it just, it, it's so frustrating to see it. You know what I'm saying? Now, you, you tell me you got to change your team. You got to change your roster. You got to change your bench. Every year, it doesn't work that way. You know what I'm saying? You know, basketball doesn't work that way. If chemistry is working, let these guys work together for two or three seasons. Then if it don't work out, you, you, you fill in some pieces. You know what I'm saying? But when it came down to last year of getting Carmelo Anthony, you showed him give up your son to get him. <laughs> so, what, you know, come on now. Let's, let, let's keep it 100. You know, everybody can see, and, they, and everybody can see, even Stevie Wonder, Conceit is that uh, Austin Rivers is not a point guard, mm. and he continues to play him at this position that he continues to fail at. You want your son to succeed, play him at the two or the three, pick and pop, and he's good to go. 
But when you try to play him at a position that he'd never be, he'd never be a Doc Rivers. He'd never be that guy. Because that's what you see. Being a point guard, you're born with it. It's something you're born with. You know what I'm saying? It's something that you've been doing for a long time. You just can't make nobody into a point guard. You know, um, Chris is a bona fide point guard. You know, Tony Parker's a bona fide point guard. You know what I'm saying? Those are those are people. Magic Johnson was the best point guard, if you, you know, in, 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 in my generation. You know what I'm saying? So you have to look at all that. You know what I'm saying? It's not about getting your son to the next level. It's not about you got your son paid already. He made $35 million for three years. Now, hey, it's time to move on. Son, I gave you your chance. I brought you back in the league. You got, you know, you got notoriety. You got notoriety now. You can, move, he can, you. You can move out of my ahead. house, right? He can move out of the Doc it, Rivers it, mansion right now. You know what I'm saying? Get it, his own mansion exactly. on his own, right. <laughs> and, and, and move on because my thing is when you don't make a trade like that, it shows, it tells me you don't want to win because you got Austin Rivers and you got Mar- uh, Carmelo Anthony. Come on, man. That's not even that's not even fair. But then when you hear it, you be like, man, he didn't want to make that move. You know, now maybe Carmelo probably wouldn't have won us a championship, but you gotta try. If you you've been changing this team, ever since you've been here, you've been changing this team. If I, if I tell you, if we go back to day one when Doc got here, we had the best bench in the NBA. And he changed it the following year instead of staying with it. And then, and then, and then, you know, I just, it, it just, it just, now I'm just so tired of, it's like, give CP3 and, and, uh, and he'll win us the game. Okay, he can do that, you know, a few times, man, but if you don't, you know, orchestrate plays, man, for this man to win, we can't succeed. You know, we, we, you know, what type of identity do we have? When Doc, before, before Glenn Rivers got there, right, before he got there, we used to call, we used to be called Live City, right? When he got there, he took away Live City. He said, we, we're no longer going to be called Live City, you see? And then when he gets there, he's so worried about covering up the Laker banners, you know, and make it Table Center a la arena. Man, that don't matter. Win. Win. When you win, baby, all that comes, all the success comes with it. I don't care what you do. Clipper Darrell joining us here on the Baseline NBA podcast. Be sure to check out his Twitter handle at Clipper Darrell. I want to I want to expound a little bit more on, on what you're speaking of because I know a lot of this is centered around Doc Rivers and and really what the future may become of this franchise with Doc Rivers still being the head coach if if that's not the case because obviously the speculation is that Doc Rivers you know uh, job as a head as a head coach he's pretty he's basically on the hot seat. But it's something that I kind of alluded to as part of, um, you know, kind of my conspiracy theory about Doc Rivers. And listen, I I, I respect Doc Rivers. He, to me, I think he's underrated as 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 one of the better and best coaches that we've had, you know, really in, in our generation. But the thing that I've noticed about Doc Rivers is, is that there are times where Doc Rivers over overwelcomes his stay, um, where maybe even to some degree he begins to weigh on people and weigh on the fan base uh, ability to accept moving forward, moving on. And I felt like that's what happened, particularly with his stay or tenure during the Boston Celtics. And I'm wondering if that aspect of Doc Rivers is what's rearing its ugly head at this moment in time, given what has happened in this offseason with him, Chris Paul, the fact that they have to pony up the money to keep Blake Griffin, and ultimately him losing his position as president of basketball operations and Jerry West coming in to undo a lot of the damage that Doc Rivers has inflicted on a basketball team that I think a lot of people have said they should always be in that conversation of being in an NBA finals and that there was no reason or justification for the Golden State Warriors to suddenly and somehow some way leapfrog past them as being the best team in the Pacific Division. What, what do you say when you hear those type of things kind of formulating? Is that what's emanating out there in Los Angeles as, as, it, as it states to Doc Rivers? But that's, that's about coaching. That comes with an identity. You know what I'm saying? Golden State came in, man. We beat them in 2014, okay? And then they came back stronger in 2015. So that's, that's, that's coaching. That's going out, getting the pieces, and putting the right pieces together. What they, what they buy into in Golden State is that, get the best shot, no matter who scores it. 
and everybody congratulates each other. Out here, it's more Hollywood ball. It's more one-on-one. It's more, oh, man, this is whose team is it? Chris's team is it? Blake's team. It don't, I don't care whose team it is, man. As long as that ball goes on the hoop, it's everybody's team. Because you can't win it all by yourself, you know? And when, once, once people get, get out of this L.A. Hollywood lifestyle and start winning games, and, and if you want to use the Laker model, man, they won. They entitled to be bad for a few years. They've won 16 championships. We ain't even got to the Western Conference Finals. You so, know how frustrating that is? No, I, I can only imagine there. And what I want to kind of do is maybe even with that now, as you know, I think the Clippers have been, I think they've done a good job in some ways of, of getting out of the Lakers' shadow. But, I mean, I've been to LA a few times, and you always hear it's always going to be Laker town, whatever the case be. But at the end of the day, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. It doesn't matter. If the Clippers win and win at a high level and win championships, mm-hmm. then that's truly when they get out of their own shadow. But so focusing the attention a little bit more even on this season currently, what were your expectations looking at the roster construction as it is? And now how has that shifted in lieu of the Blake Griffin injury where he's going to be out for the next few months? I really thought when, when the season first started, losing Chris and everything, I said, man, we're going to be about a 30 to 35 win team. Wow. I said, you know, I, yeah. You know, I said nine new players. We got to get, everybody got to get used to one another. Um, I just didn't see no, nobody taking over the team because the players that we had was basically role players. You know what I'm saying? And if, but if you knew how to do it, if you knew how to put them all together, it, it'd be different. But, uh, Glenn Rivers is not that type of coach. You know what I'm saying? Now, you know, when, when Doc Rivers played the game, he was a great point guard. But now Glenn Rivers is taking over because he's no longer the doctor because a doctor, to me, knows what he's doing. It's like a guy that just goes out there and gets five guys, hey, I want you, you, and you. Come on out here, man. We're going to play some ball. And that's how we look out there. We look like a, a team. That, like, it's like a pickup game on our side of offense, even on defense, man. The guys get confused. You know, and and people want to say, oh, man, it's experience, it's rookie, they don't know the system. Nah, bro. If you know this game, man, you know what I'm saying? It's like nobody could tell you. If you go on somebody else's radio show, nobody could tell you how to speak on the radio. If you go do it, if you have a job that you're going to do and you got to go, to, you know, if this, if, if your coworker is not in, you got to go do his job. That's what you do. You can watch them do it. You know, so that's what we don't have. We don't have fillers. You see what I'm saying? Like, we don't have that guy. We have a five-man rotation, and not just bring in, in substitutes, you know. And, and basketball is not played like that. You know what I'm saying? That there's a rotation that you go with, and you believe in your bench. You know what I'm saying? Don't give, don't give a guy – all our starters play anywhere between 37 to 42 minutes a game. That's too many minutes, okay? That never give – you, you can't you can go out there and play a game in five minutes I mean, getting the game for five minutes and thinking that you you about to do something. It ain't going to happen. You know, a a, a bench player should be able to play at least 10 to 15 minutes a game. Easy. You know, 15, 20 minutes at the most. You know, and I understand that. But then it was just like when when the Clippers come back from behind, the bench did that. They come back from behind, they're down 19, 20 points. They come back behind to lead the game. What did he do? He benched the. The, the, guy, the guys that did it and brought the starters back. What kind of reward is that? So you have to know how to coach a team. You see what I'm saying? And when you communicate, it's all about communication, man. When y'all put this show together, y'all communicated on what y'all wanted to do. You, you know your role, to, your, your co-host knows his role. That's how life is. It's just like in a relationship, the same thing. Your girl knows her role, you know your role. You know what bills you're going to pay, she don't know what bills she's going to pay because y'all communicated. We don't have that, man. We look discombobulated out there. Flipper Darrell joining us here on the Baseline NBA podcast as we're getting in deep uh, and really trying to understand the, the Los Angeles Clippers, the state of affair, what's happening out there in Clipperland. I, I, listen, just talking with you, my man, it just really feels like th- there's, there's, going, there's some serious coupling counseling that needs to happen out there with the Los Angeles Clippers. And I- I'm more curious now that we, we've we kind of really kind of dissected. And, and, I, and you know, let's not sugarcoat this. I, I, a lot of this really now lays on the shoulders, you know, of, of Doc Rivers and, and what he is, is set up here because 
whatever happens moving forward, I don't know if whether or not it's going to be over the course of a season that when we can lift this cloud that's seeming to kind of float over the state of affairs that's happening with the Los Angeles Clippers. I will say, though, that I am a little curious about how you feel with reference to Jerry West. Like, where do you see Jerry West fitting in all of this? Let's just say for a moment that Jerry West is not enamored with what's happening with Doc Rivers, the team, and the state of affairs that's happening with the Clippers. Where do you see him coming in and having the kind of imprint that he has had on other franchises, turning whatever black black cat cloud is hanging over him, to something where people in the in, in, in the Los Angeles community, the Clipper community, can start feeling a little bit more confident about what's gonna happen with this team moving forward. You got you gotta think about it. You you can't you Jerry can't do miracles, right? It's a respect. Okay. When guys don't wanna come, free agents don't wanna come play for you, that's a big deal. You know what I'm saying? So when people my thing is it's like it, when 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 free agents say, "Hey, man, I don't want to play for I don't want to play for Glenn Rivers. That's not me. You know, don't don't send me there. I'm not. I don't even want to be bothered. That's a bad thing. So uh, with Jerry West, his hands are tied. You see what I'm saying? Unless Bomber makes the move and says, "Hey, man, go put him in the front office. Go do whatever. I know. You know, he's owed a, a substantial amount of money. But sometimes, man, you just got to eat it." You know, I would have never gave him an extension like he did anyway. You know, but, you know, in Bomber's defense, he was excited. You know what I'm saying? Getting a team and stuff like that. He wasn't thinking as a businessman. He was thinking as a fan at the time. Now he's thinking of a, as a businessman, you know, but it sometimes it's too late because we get caught up in our feelings. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you don't want to make yourself look stupid, you know? But sometimes, man, starting all over, man, is, is the healthiest thing you can do because my thing is, I would have, let, I would have, honestly, once CP3 asked for the trade, I would have just said, hey, Blake, you know what? We would love to have you back, but, you know, we we just going to go in a different direction and start all over. Blake is not that Blake is not that player to where he, he's, a, he's a game changer. Blake is, a two or, Blake is a two or a three option. You know what I'm saying? I love Blake with all my heart. You know what I'm saying? I like Blake as a person, as a player. I, lo- I love him on the Los Angeles Clippers. Don't get me wrong. But when you when you're talking about business, when you're talking about business of the franchise, you know he's seen an opportunity yet. Now the Clippers are going to be my team. I mean, of course, it's no longer here. But when it's your team, man, you a six ten guy shooting three pointers, man, doesn't look good. You know, you know you supposed to be you supposed to be banging down low, man, with the best. You know, it's supposed to be an inside out game with you. You know what I'm saying? Where where Lou Williams or or Wesley, you know Wesley Johnson is at the wings, man, and you know they putting it in when you can't do it. That's what this game is supposed to be about. It ain't about an individual. See, when people make it, when when players make it about themselves, that's when it's bad. Like LeBron, if you ever notice, LeBron don't make it about himself in his tweets or whatever he might do that then. But when he plays this game, man, he gives that ball up. You know, he shares the ball because he knows what it does for people and what he does, what it does for confidence. You know, now you know, hey, man, when I got the ball, be prepared for it. You know what I'm saying? When Blake gets the ball, the ball stops and he shoots. it. Blake can have two or three guys on him and still try to shoot the ball. If you got two or three guys on you, man, somebody's open. But it's all about, but, but that's where I tell people it's all about, about coaching. It's all about the ability of coaching and talking to these star players that the ones as leaders of your team and telling them what they need to do. You see, they they don't have no, like when you look at the Spurs, man, they don't have no selfish bone in their body. When you look at the Warriors, there's no selfish bone in their body, man. When somebody misses a shot, everybody runs back on defense. You don't see no powders. You don't see nobody getting upset. No, so I was going to interject real quick because I think that's something where the Clippers have been long noted for, you know, as, as being crybabies and powders, especially when Chris Paul was there and things of that nature. And I think, you know, on, on, on one hand, I'll disagree a little bit because I think Blake does get a bad rap. When he first came in the league, he was, you know, he was dunking all over everybody and then said, and people said that's all he did. Now that he's mm-hmm. kind of expanded to be a pick and pop type of guy and, and does a lot of ball handling, maybe something, but he does pound it sometimes, you know, when tried to take on two or three times, two or three guys. So I definitely see that as well, too. But, you said something that I really want to get your take on. Because you said when you saw when you heard that CP3 would have was 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 not going to return, they're going to make that trade. That you would not have offered Blake that money. So 
So again, I guess we're now in a kind of a transitional phase. Now with Blake being out two months, the, the, the sharks are circling and saying, all right, well now it's time to blow it up. They're eight and 13, whatever the case would be, they lost whatever it is, eight out of their last 10 or however many games we are right now as we record this podcast. Now it's all oh, DeAndre Jordan to Milwaukee, DeAndre Jordan to Cleveland, things of that nature. Are you, as somebody who's been a long, long-term long fan of this team and someone who understands the inner workings of what's going on there, is this where you're at? Are you are you one of those sharks in the water, if you will, and saying, okay, blow it up because this season now seems to be almost lost now that Blake Griffin is gone for two months? Exactly. I, I, I am. I mean, I'm willing to start all over now because there's no way that until, you know, great coaches do great things with players. I can go in right now and get 30 wins out of these guys. I could. People gonna say, "Oh man, all uh, players are start. Our starters are hurt. Our superstars. Only one superstar. And that's Blake Griffin. Gallinari's not a superstar. Patrick Beverly's not a superstar. Milos, T- Milos, T- uh, you know, T ain't no superstar. You see, those are role players. And, and when you're a great coach, you would know that already, and you would ne- never have to worry about that because you have fillers in." So now you get a backup to 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 to, to, T, uh, to Milos T. You get a backup to Patrick Beverly. You got a backup to uh, uh, to Gallinari. You know what I'm saying? And you got a backup to Blake. But you're not utilizing the guys the way they should be utilized. You see, because we don't have a backup to Milos because to me he's using this he, he uses Austin and Austin is not a point guard. Now everybody knows that. Okay, so that's yeah. You know, I don't know what he's trying to do with that. But then the, uh, you got you got Montrezl Harrell on the on the bench that could back up Blake. You got um, Willie Reed that can back up DJ. Man, he's not utilizing these guys right because without a structure, without a system, you can't you you, you playing freelance ball. So they, these guys don't know what to do. If you had a system in place and 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 a structure, these guys would know exactly what to do when you know when, when it's their time. That's why they look so confused out there. You're saying yes, so you, you'd blow it up per se right now. So you're all in on DeAndre moving on and, and getting whatever deal you for him right now this season. You're willing to, to make that trade right now if it comes about. No, I mean, because what, what, what are we going to get? What are we going to get for Blake? We're not going to get anybody. Nobody's giving up nobody for, you know. It, when, when, you, when, when you traded, traded CP3, right, you gave up a floor general man that controlled the whole situation. You didn't get really, you didn't really get a lot back for him, and you didn't get a key point guard. You brought in Milos, but now he's hurt. But you didn't get a good backup. You know what I'm saying? You know, Glenn Rivers made the same mistake when he gave up when he let Darren Collison go when he had to back up to CP3 before. He didn't want to give him his, his five million dollars. But you give your son thirty five million. That's a, a, a approximately twelve million a year. But you didn't want to give Darren Collison five million, and I, and I bet my house a one-on-one matchup with Darren Collison and Austin Rivers, and I and I bet you Darren Collison to eat him up, and I give Austin Rivers five five points to eleven. So I know this. I know this game, man. I love this game. I love this team. But Doc Rivers has ruined this whole organization single-handedly. That's some powerful stuff. <laughs> I mean, I, I really there's not there's not much that I can and I can say. Uh, Flipper Darrell, let me uh, let me ask you because we got a few more questions before we let you you know uh, stomp on out of here. Most people can't slide up on out of here on on you know with the insight that you've been giving us today so far. But to your point, let's just say for the sake of argument that the idea here is that we have to. You know, comp- you know, move in a different direction. And part of that direction is Doc Rivers is no longer the head coach for this basketball team. You still have... Oh, 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 <laughs> I'm having a party, baby. <laughs> so clearly I'm we know where to coach. be at when that does go down, Shaw, all right? But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let, make sure that we put that on the calendar. But Not LA ASAP. <laughs> but if that, if, if that were to happen, now what do you do when you're talking about head coaches that are coming in, when you know that what you already have in place is a player like a Blake Griffin, we've seen this kind of cycle kind of happen before with other basketball teams. They just, 
they cycle through the head coaches a whole lot more than they cycle through the perception that they believe in the player that they've dished out franchise money for. You know, we can already point to a situation with Carmelo Anthony. So, so my question for you is, is given what you've endured and seen with this team, if the idea is that you move from, from, from Doc Rivers, what kind of head coach are you looking for? Are you looking for a head coach that is going to look for someone that is going to be the point man, the leader man, like a, another CP3? Or do you think that you go in a completely different direction simply because of the fact that you have Blake Griffin on this basketball team? You looking at you looking at you gotta go you gotta go with somebody that's no houses and shit that can share the spotlight. You go after a guy like Mark Jackson. You go after a guy like uh, Fisdale. You go you gotta go after a coaches a coach that's a great communicator, a guy that communicates with his guys, that gets their opinions, that value what they say and take it take their opinion in, into consideration. Blake Griffin is not a point guard. Blake, when you when you see a six ten guy bringing a ball up, as, 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 that's why he gets the ball stolen. That's why he gets the turnovers he gets. That's not Blake's job to do. But now, if he's at the three point line and and the ball is swinging around and he shoots a three, I'm cool with that. But him, but for him to be at the top of the key, last second shot, and and he's dribbling the ball and then he shoots and he shoots a game winner, that's not his forte. That's not him. He's too tall for that. A little a little guard will take the ball from him because see when you dribble when you dribble when you're tall if you notice how LeBron dribbles if you notice how Magic Johnson used to dribble if you notice how Kobe dribbles they the ball dribbles so fast that you it's hard to take you know what I'm saying when 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 Blake Griffin dribbles the ball it goes doom doom so it gives the, that little guy that's why he gets the ball turned over until he gets that that, that fast dribble. That's different, but he's not low to the ground either. So the ball comes up too high. DJ, they have to set DJ up down low, okay? You got to shoot DJ around between a five to an eight footer. It'll be it'll be deadly for him, but they don't do that. DJ, when now this year they're letting him touch the ball a lot more. I've been saying that. If you let DJ touch that ball, man, it throws the offense, it throws the defensive set off. When people come in and play the Clippers, they say, oh, man, we're playing four on five anyway because – they never give DJ the ball. Only thing DJ does is put back. You see what I'm saying? But he leaves the, the, the league in rebound. So you gotta be able to utilize your players. And I and I and I know when you bring in a, a smarter coach that will utilize them guys in, in that in that way, man. And if they and if the guys believe in them, man, because I believe in DJ, and I believe DJ can could develop I mean, anywhere between a five between a five and a ten footer easy. He can develop that. But you gotta feed it to them, and this is the season because we ain't making the playoffs. So this is the, this is the time to develop. Them. Let him make mistakes. Have you ever noticed when he when he makes the mistakes, man? He jump back down on defense, man, and does something crazy. That's what basketball is all about. Let these guys play, man. Quit trying to control every aspect of the game, man. This game is not a one on one game. This game is a team game. Share the ball and let them play. Uh, Clipper Darrell, I think, you know, I think you said it all, you know, for, from our standpoint there, too. I think very, very insightful and unique takes here, I think, on the Clippers. that I don't know if all our fans or even CL and I have quite heard in this way. I think we've heard um, some things about Dark Rivers, you know, to, to some degree, uh, but not to the to the depth in which you've explained it today for that. So we definitely want to thank you for coming on the show and, 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 and giving us your take on, on the state of the Clippers franchise and where they could potentially be going you know, or not going, I guess, the rest of this regular season in some cases. And it would be very interesting to see, you know, to see if they uh, find a way to develop, you know, DeAndre Jordan a little bit further or if they decide to trade him, you know, prior to the trade deadline, man. Again, I think they will all, all eyes will be watching. But we know where to go if Doc Rivers' swan song ever does come about. We'll be the first one yeah. to party with you, brother. He is the man. He is one like no other. If you really want to hear him, you know what I'm saying, go on full hundred then you definitely need to check out his new show, The Fan Truth. It's on Dash Radio, uh, the, the Twitter handle for the show, at fan underscore truth. He is a host, personality, a basketball lifer, uh, the man like no other. He also has a float that will be featured at the Compton Parade. And I'm hoping, and I'm sure my man Shaw is hoping as well too, that him along with Jack Nicholson will be riding along on that float. <laughs> 
<laughs> It'll be a pipe dream. But more than anything, man. Hey, don't forget Spike Lee, baby. Don't forget Spike Lee. <laughs> you got to put Spike on it. You got to put Spike on there as well, too. Uh, Clipper Daryl, man, we so appreciate you hopping on board with us this week to break down the Clippers. And congratulations, one, on the new show. And also congratulations on the on the float and the presentation at the upcoming Compton Parade. Brother, happy for you. But I appreciate y'all having me today, though. Still aftermath, and ain't nothing after that. Time to go aftermath, Cali Warren Shaw, the Baseline NBA podcast. What a phenomenal interview with our man Clipper Daryl Shaw. Oh, man, where do you, where do we begin with this? Where where do we begin with this? If Clipper Daryl is basically saying they have had it up to here with Doc Rivers as the head coach, I mean, like Dr. Dre said, you know, if it's a rap, it's a rap. <laughs> right? Like can any yeah, more be I, said about that? Well, I think he he brought some definitely unique takes that I don't know if I was expecting in terms of the amount of heat he had for Doc, um, in general for building he, this organization. Butane, brother, butane. <laughs> yeah, but for building the roster, but not only the roster construction, but the overall rotations, how he's player development and things of that nature. There was a, a lot of things there, you know, that he's laying at the feet of Doc Rivers. Um, well, Glenn Rivers, as he was calling him in the interview, and saying, you know what, this is a result of his inability to kind of get it done. And I think there is some blame there for sure. Um, but I also think it may be in the case of DeAndre Jordan, whether or not they make a trade right now, I'm not of that mindset right now where I think they should be trying to take pennies on the dollar for any of their players, per se. But it would be hard for a guy like DeAndre Jordan to uh, all of a sudden gain a jump shot in the middle of the season. You know, that's something that he needed to be working on throughout the summer. And the fact that he's however many years in the league now and doesn't quite have that, I don't think he can put that on Doc Rivers. <laughs> you know what I mean? DeAndre Jordan not having an 8-10 to 10 foot reliable J on a regular basis is not anybody but DeAndre Jordan. Well, I'm a little, but I'm a little confused, Shaw, because when I look at what happened in this offseason, because when I listen to Clipper Darrell, and, and I don't want to sound like I'm out of step with where he was coming from, but when I, when I listen to what he was talking about and I look at what happened in this offseason, essentially – Clipper Darrell had no confidence about Blake Griffin really being the, the, the franchise of this basketball team. He may be getting, he may look like, you know what I'm saying, he's the superstar player. But if you're talking about winning a championship, what the, the Clippers did in that trade for Chris Paul set in motion a chain of events that we're now coming to this point where we maybe in some, you know, far out of the galaxy in some alternative world, this would be acceptable. But I think amongst the people who have really been following the Clippers, especially himself, Clipper Darrell, he didn't find what happened with Chris Paul being acceptable because what you replace that, that player that, you know, that centerpiece with are a bunch of moving, unconvincing parts that not only would outshine whatever Blake Griffin does or doesn't give you, but gives you something to look forward to about this transition of you know the, the trifecta that they had with Paul Griffin and Jordan. I think that speaks volumes because I didn't really expect it to be that harsh of a denunciation as much as it being, you know, Chris Paul, this, we said that these three can't play together. They've got to move on from that. I just didn't think it was Chris Paul was the person that was going to move first. I thought it would have been Blake and I thought it would have been, it would have been Jordan. And the fact that it was Chris Paul that got moved, I think, really set this whole thing in motion. And now that I listen to him, I'm not saying I believe everything, but I can understand a lot of where that frustration is because now that Blake Griffin has been injured again, we cannot look at this basketball team in any way, shape, or form unless we look at it despairingly in the same way that we've been felt with the frustrations that this team has produced under Doc Rivers over the last five years. What I'll say about this is that I don't disagree with his point on Blake Griffin. Blake, to me, is he's an all-star level talent. He's an all-NBA level talent. But that doesn't mean he's a franchise player. And I have him kind of in the same mold. I have a guy like Paul George, where it's like, I think they can be your, your number two. Um, and or they can Kevin be, Love. Yeah, I mean, they can be guys who, who produce and, and do a lot for you. But I don't know. They just don't seem to have that that leadership quality. You know what I mean? That factor, that kind of uplifts the rest of this roster despite whatever playmaking abilities that they have and again i don't want to bring paul george into it you know but he plays to both ways and all those things again great phenomenal basketball player who just could help any any roster 
But when he's your number one guy, he's the guy that everybody else in that team is looking to for that leadership. I just don't think they have that star quality. So I, I agree with him there when it, when it comes to Blake. But at the same time, it's just franchises consistently get into this mold. Well, what do, do you really just say, we're going to blow it all the way up? Chris Paul left. He chose. He opted out or he opted in, in essence, in essence to accept the trade. Uh, but he was going to leave knowing, I guess, he saw what was all, what could be, could be the future here. But what I'm very concerned about, what we don't know is, all the, all the, with all the Vultures circling and saying, okay, DeAndre Jordan is going to be traded potentially this season, it's like, what assurances do they make, if any, to, to Blake Griffin in terms of what this roster is going to be like? And now do you have, you know, uh, this $200 million guy on your team who's now going to be a super malcontent if you trade DeAndre Jordan away and don't get acceptable parts of back? So for me, the Clippers are in a very precarious situation, and I'll be very, very interested to see how it goes for the rest of this season. One other thing that we didn't get an opportunity to talk with Clipper Darrell on, but I think he, he, he did highlight this as well because he talked an emphasis, and it, it really points to what, you, what, what the interview had started off with is his malcontent of how Rivers has utilized the Clippers bench. And he said how, you know, some years ago, the first year that Doc Rivers was there, they had a legitimate bench. They had a good bench, right? Um, you look at what Doc Rivers has done over the last few years in drafting the talent. A lot of this talent that has come on this basketball team has been imported, right? It's not been homegrown. And I think that also is going to be pointing a little bit towards, you know, Doc Rivers in a bad light. Bryce Johnson, right? I mean, this guy was, a, 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 you know, a, a highly touted talent with a lot of upside. He's raw in talent, but he had opportunity for growth. The guy barely is getting four minutes on the basketball court. Remember, they had Reggie Bullocks, another dude. And he's out there producing for other basketball teams coming off the bench, right? It, 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 and it, it just seems like, you know, if you're not going to be able to get the right bench people on this team to produce at the level that everyone expects the Clippers, you better damn sure make sure that you're drafting talent that is going to come off the bench to do something for you that you're not able to get from guys that you're shelling out money in free agency for. And I think those two things meeting at a head is also what's going against Doc Rivers and what's happening right now and why they're, everyone out there in Clipperland is calling for Rivers' head. Well, I think that's a fair point to some degree. Um, you know, trans transformational talent, if you are, usually not at the end of the first round, you know, where the Clippers have been traditionally been picking because they've had success, you know, so in the 20s and if, if you will, with the case would be. But you're right 100% in terms of like, well, you can usually get, you know, a specialist. So do you need a rebounder? Do you need a three-point shooter? Do you need a defender on the wings? You should be able to identify those specialists in kind of in, in that range. And I feel like they have missed the boat there and they have like guys kind of come in and out and um, and some guys who haven't panned out at all, if you will. So they haven't done the greatest job, but they haven't had the greatest position. But like I just said, that's where I think they should have maybe tried to focus because they might they might be trying to get, uh, you know, uh, they're trying to hit a home run when they really should be trying to get sing singles, you know, with, with their draft position that they have. And, and they haven't done either with those with the with the with that in the last couple of seasons. So unfortunately for the Clippers, um, it's not looking very good for them for the rest of this, for this season. And it hasn't been very good despite the level of talent that they've had on their roster for the last five years. Um, and again, I'm, I, I just, I hope somehow or, or, or in some way, there's some sort of resolution that comes, you know, relatively quickly because this team, because LA and Clipper Darrell and all that, that LA fan base, Billy Crystal and the whole nine, they deserve better. Um, and with I hope they get better very, very soon. All right. Well, what do you think? Our listeners here at the Baseline NBA Podcast, do you think that the time has come? Is Doc Rivers, should he be on the outs? We definitely want to get your thoughts and your take about the state of, of affairs with the Los Angeles Clippers. Be sure to get at us at NBA Baseline. Coming up on a segment of The Drop, we got a new segment we like to throw out there, man. You know, my man Sean and I, we always like to get creative with this stuff, man. So, uh... We want to make sure that there's some players out there in the game right now, if, if, if they good, if they all right, they might be running a fever or so. So check us out here on the flip side here on the Baseline NBA Podcast. Drop, drop, drop. Time now for the drop. Callie Warren Shaw of the Baseline NBA Podcast. New segment, hot take. Here we go. So Shaw and I have been sitting here over the course of this weekend, we've been mulling around, thinking what's another way that we can bring in a fresh new way to, you know what I'm saying, liven up the show, obviously. Our show is always live, but my man Shaw came in, he's like, you know, sometimes, man, we see some of these guys out here on the basketball court, balling, they, they, 
be saying to yourself, man, you good? You all right? You okay? Because when you look at the, the, the numbers and the stats, man, kind of skittish. Really skittish. So there's a few players, Shaw, that, you know, we're we looking at a little suspect right now talking about, hey, bro, hey, you, you good? You all right? Are you good? You sure? You, sure? you all right? We need to check your temperature. You know what I mean? So spark it off, brother. Like, who, who out there right now needs to be put on this list? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know how I want to start it, but I'll give the R fans list a little bit of kind of the, you know, the, the backstory, if you will. And the first player I really probably should be talking about is uh, Bismack Biyombo. And again, a lot of people in the NBA circles are like, okay, he's just a good basketball player. But it's hilarious to me that this is a dude who, you know, got this massive contract after playing great basketball, Toronto Raptors in the playoffs, signed with Orlando. And then last year, Frank Vogel was thinking about starting over Nikola Vucevic. You know I mean, like we've gone from that to where he is now just a year later, and Vogel is still the coach, if you will. And now we're looking at a guy like Biombo, and like I almost forgot he was in the league. I, you know, having to catch an Orlando Magic game, and I was like, oh yeah, that dude. <laughs> What's going on here? Hey, bro, hey, bro, you good? And you know, and I look at it, you know, look at his numbers, you know, fifteen plus minutes or whatever you will, like four four points, four rebounds, and and they're just kind of like, hey man, you all right? Like, what happened? What happened in the situation of Bismack Biombo where he was challenging Vucevic for a starting position last year, and now he can barely get off the damn pine in Orlando? Yeah, so I, listen, I agree with you. I completely agree with you. I, it, it's amazing. This guy was beloved. He was one of the main reasons that Toronto Raptors found themselves playing in the Eastern Conference Finals. If not for him in the semifinal rounds, the Raptors wouldn't have even made the finals. Because remember, Valanciunas got injured and was unable to play. So Bismack Biyombo's presence, his play, is what got him that umpteen million dollar deal down in Orlando. And to go from a guy who we were talking about as, hey, one of those, you know, under the radar free agency acquisitions to... Hey, bro. Hey, bro. You good? You all right? You sure? You sure? Yeah, and it's... It you know, because he's only 25 years old, you know, but a rookie guy like Jonathan Isaac, who's also now has also been hurt, uh, but he came in, was taking minutes away from him. I think most Bates is not playing a bunch of minutes, but the 12 minutes he is playing, that's cutting into probably some of the time that he'd be getting. And again, in a new NBA, or not really that new anymore, where um, you need to be a little bit more stretchy, <laughs> you know, if you're going to be out there in that four and five position, and Bismack is not that. Um, but it's again, it's just it's hilarious to me because I was watching like he got some minutes, you know, he got a rebound, and I really had to say to myself, "Damn man, what happened here? You all right?" So Bismack Biombo is a, kind of the captain and the catalyst of this team um, for me. Um, not, another guy too I want to talk about is, is George Hill. Uh, George Hill. Yeah, George. We had... jo George Hill. You good? Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Shaw. Sure. Why? Why George Hill? So this is a duel where last year we're the same thing. We're discussing his importance to the Utah Jazz. Like the Jazz were winning 70% of the games or whatever that he started or, you know, some ridiculous number, right? Um, and then he was hurt and banged up like he typically is and things of that nature. And then they would really struggle without him. And he was, you know, because he was hurt and banged up again in the playoffs, that probably really kind of uh, sealed their demise, although they weren't going to be going to say it regardless, but nevertheless, right? Now he signs this deal in, in, in Sacramento, um, not quite the deal he was hoping for, because I think he could have signed a, a, a more lucrative deal with Utah, but didn't, thought he was, he was overplaying his hand a little bit. He was overplaying the, his value at the time, and then found out that free agency was a little bit drier than he hoped it would be. But still, people saw him, you know, 31-year-old veteran guy, Sacramento, yeah, he's going to be coming into the time of the Aaron Fox, but this is a veteran guy who can really help them out of what I'm saying. You look at his numbers now, 25 minutes, getting just about nine points per game, 2.4 assists, three rebounds. I mean, this is, that hasn't turns. been as low. He hasn't, that's has been as low since 2008, 2009, right? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just not impressed, you know? And I know Sacramento isn't, isn't a good basketball team, but here's the thing, right? You're, if you're a good basketball player, you're supposed to be shining, you know, on, on a bad basketball team. So I'm sure he's having the locker locker room support that is necessary, along with Vince Carter and Zach Randolph. I'm sure he's doing his part there. But on the court, I just don't see it, man. And it's prompted me to say, hey, bro, you good? Yeah, I, listen, I completely agree with you. I think George Hill is one of those guys where I think on another basketball team, what he has accumulated in his experience and his play would have been well-suited. Uh, but listen, I don't blame the Sacramento Kings. 
because maybe in their mind they felt like what he can give guys like De'Aaron Fox can help accelerate his process to be the premier point guard for that basketball team. But clearly, I mean, listen, man, De'Aaron Fox was just like, nah, I ain't waiting for the, I ain't waiting for the George Hill crash course and making it in the NBA. He already doing it on his own. So it almost just makes George Hill obsolete. Cali Warnshaw of the Baseline NBA podcast, a segment of the drop. Um, got another person right there that you, you you feel. I kind of feel bad because I was giving this kid some high hopes, right? He's more of on the rookie side of things still because he's only in his, what, second season, basically? Marquise Chris, right? I mean, do we have to check him? Hey, Marquise, you good? <laughs> <laughs> you all right? <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? Like, you, you, you're supposed to be part of that, that fresh face of the Phoenix Suns, right? You know what I'm saying? The newbies coming in, taking over things out in the West Co- Western West Coast, right? With him and Devin Booker. But that's not how that's playing out. You know what I'm saying? You're right, brother. And uh, unfortunately for Chris, you know, a, a report had recently dropped. And there's nothing great about what's happening in Phoenix altogether. We know that they've, you know, they've been the, the proverbial dumpster fire for much of the season, firing, having the first coach fired in the NBA season as well, too. But Chris, recent report comes out that he came in is overweight, you know, was out of shape coming into camp. You're 20 years old, man. Like, what are you doing? And he was taking his opportunity on the Phoenix Suns, I guess, for granted. It's like, okay, he thought he was the incumbent. He was going to be that starting power forward. And there was going to be nothing to be said about it. Well, you know, our man, or Watson had nothing, had nothing to do with it and, and bench Chris to, to begin the year and decided he would start, you know, TJ Warren and, and, um, uh, um, man, I'm forgetting his name. Sorry, Josh Jackson at, at, at the fourth, at the fourth spot. And, and Chris was, he was livid. He was upset. He's like, how, how could this happen? But nevertheless, that change happened. And then they brought in the interim coach at Triano and Chris kind of got a starting job back, but now he's been shuffling in and out of that lineup again. And to me, Marquis Chris, although only in the second year, um, you're supposed to be better that second year than you are your rookie. You're not supposed to be taking regression at that stage of your career. Six points, four rebounds a game um, in, in roughly 20 minutes, um, but just it looked terribly unimpressive. 39% from the floor um, as a guy who really is a, is a four man and not super stretchy, if you will. Uh, yeah, he can go out there and knock down some mid range stops here and there, but you know he's just not a very good basketball player at this stage in the second year. And to me, he he's not good. <laughs> and so I think the Phoenix Suns are hoping for a lot more for him for the rest of the season. All right. One last person, Shaw, that we, we definitely think might be worthy of, of acknowledging. I, it's kind of twisted how we're doing this. But if we basically said, hey, Nicholas Batum, you good? You all right? I feel bad for saying it that way because every time I feel like that, it, it's really like he's like laying out on the basketball court, holding on, clutching on something on his body part that fell out because homie can't stay healthy, man. Straight up and down. Talented brother. Really talented. And I'm sure that the Hornets organization was a – so, man, listen, just give us 50% of Batum but 100% healthy, right? Like, that's what it feels like right now. And anytime I go up to him and say, yo, Batum, you good? Bro, you all right? I'm not saying that because I think your game is lost. I'm saying that because are you going to stay healthy? Are you going to be on the basketball court long enough for us to see you from the beginning to maybe the end of a basketball season? Right. And I think with him, and it, like I said, it all starts with health with, with Batum. And um, he's back. He's been nicked up again, too. He missed another game since coming back with that elbow. Um, but only at 27 minutes a night where he's been 30 or more for the last roughly seven seasons, if you will. Like, he's a guy who's, again, not just a rotation player. He's a high-level rotation guy and somebody that a team really does depend on on, on, on a regular basis. And he's just not producing quite yet. And you can say he's still banged up with catching his win and maybe Clifford is monitoring his minutes a little bit. And they have some great, great help from, you know, almost the opposite of this segment where we're talking about a couple of weeks ago with the emergence of Jeremy Lamb. So I think Lamb, great play is kind of like, all right, maybe they take a little bit slower with Batum and even a rookie like Malik Monk, you know, has gotten a couple of minutes here and there as well, too. Um, but for me, Batum is a guy who's, who, who does it for them on both ends, can pass the basketball to help Kemba create and get others involved. Um, they're going to need him to get back on track more than the 10 and a half points a game. But more importantly, the fact that he's only start shooting 37% from the floor and 22% from three, very concerning from an offensive standpoint for Nicholas Batum. Yeah, man. So so a lot of guys right now that we're, we're, we're keeping our eye. We got our eyes fixated on them, man. We got the GPS satellite roaming around all parts of the NBA, right? And so Josh Richardson, Jay Crowders, they were almost on it. We almost had them on our, on our list. But uh, but suffice to say, they they saw the writing on the wall, start stepping their game up. Now they're important cogs once more for their respective basketball teams. But don't be that dude. 
Kali Warnshaw, Baseline NBA Podcast. And this was The Drop. Time now to go coast to coast discussing the news in the association. You ready to rock and roll, Mr. Shaw? Absolutely, man. Let's, let's ride. All right. Derek Rose is back to talking with the Cleveland Cavs of the possibilities of coming back to the team. Are we feeling his return? I don't know if they are. Um, you know, as we record winners of 11 straight games, they're just fine without him. Things seem to be bubbling. Um, Rose coming back, I think, is more a matter of Rose just wanting to get back to the game. But I'm sure the Cavs, LeBron, and all those guys will welcome back with open arms. Just a matter of what his role will be when he does return. All right. Now, major injuries going down the pipe, so we're going to run through them as best as we possibly can. Uh, first, out in Cleveland, it might be good timing if Derrick Rose decides to show up for this basketball team. Iman Shumpert to, go un uh, to undergo knee surgery. He's going to be out for a significant amount of time. How important is it the Cavs losing Iman Shumpert for their team? Well, <laughs> this is going to sound backhanded in a way. Unfortunately for him, the original injury just didn't heal the way they wanted it to. But my backhandedness comes in where, as I think they were trying to put him in potential deal with Tristan Thompson to maybe move him out of there. So the fact that he's now injured and is going to be on the shelf for a little while is obviously going to prohibit any trades from happening with the punch jumper. So this is more business than it is basketball. Out in Orlando, Terrence Ross. He is now out indefinitely with a knee injury, albeit I don't know if it's going to matter much. The Magic have been scuffling, but certainly his scoring capabilities is certainly going to be well, uh, is going to be lost uh, when it comes to the Orlando Magic and that basketball. Yeah, I hope Ross, Ross gets back soon, but I think this means it opens up time for, for Jonathan Simmons now to really kind of go into that starting lineup and take on, you know, three plus minutes a night on a regular basis, which I think should be great for him. Um, and then also give Jonathan Isaac the chance to, to shine when he gets back as well, too. But hope Ross gets back soon. You know, it was, it was kind of a brutal looking injury if you saw it over the, over the course of the last week. All right. Out in Miami, Hassan Whiteside, um, significant injury with his knee. He's expected to be out until mid-December. Can the Miami Heat hang on without uh, without Whiteside? Yeah, yeah, we don't know. Um, you know, and a lot of conflicting reports coming there from out of Orlando where he's like, he keeps telling the team that it's, it's a bigger issue than they seem to be leading on. They're like, hey, just rest it up. We'll give you some rehab. <laughs> you know, put some ice on it and it'll be fine. So um, hopefully Whiteside um, and the team, rather, hopefully the team is correct and Whiteside will be back on the court sooner than later. Um, but if he's out, that really is going to impact their chances of making the playoff run as I know they were wanting to do that down here in South Florida. All right, out in Atlanta, John Collins and Dwayne Dedman both out with significant injuries, shoulder and leg respectively. Collins out one to two weeks and Dedman out three to six weeks. Shaw, uh, what does that leave for the rest of the remaining roster of the Atlanta Hawks? Or do they even have a roster still at le uh, left at all? That means Ersan Eliasova and Mike Mascala, when he gets back, um, now get the lion's share of the mim minutes, if you will, and um, that's not all that sexy. <laughs> so uh, Luke Babbitt, I guess we get some touches as well, too. Um, but it's really unfortunate in the case of Collins because I've been screaming from the mountaintops to, like, let this rookie go, free the shackles, let him ride out. So as soon as Edmund went, ended up going down, Collins himself goes out and gets hurt a couple game, games later. So hopefully both of those guys are back um, and they can, you know, really develop for, for the Atlanta Hawks for the future. All right, out in Toronto, Lucas Nogueira, he sustains a right calf tear. He is out indefinitely. This guy has been logging in some serious minutes for the Toronto Raptors and certainly a key role player for them. Yeah, shame, right? Because as you said, he first year that he's really, really, truly a part of this rotation as Valanciunas continues to shower with, with Dwayne Casey and the and Toronto organization. Um, so I thought Lucas was going to have a chance to really maybe even surplant Valanciunas at some point this season. Hopefully he's back soon again, as is the case with everybody that we're talking about on this injury list. Um, but really in the case of him, because he's been trying to get his minutes on for a long time now, and this was finally the year that it was happening for him. All right, Sean. Finally, Anthony Davis. Speculations that his groin injury may lead to something a lot more significant. It's been slated date to day, but there are possible reports that the situation may be far worse, and I know it's frustrating the heck out of you. Yeah, well, it is frustrating for me as a fantasy owner, but I think more so, you know, for the, for the Orleans Pelicans. And they even updated the injury um, over the weekend. They said it's, it's, a, it's a pelvic injury. They originally thought it was the groin. So, you know, our good friend Mo Johnson, you know, he said, I'm sure his teammates are tired tired of carrying his A off the court on a regular basis every year. To carry a pelvis, right? <laughs> why, why, carry, why carry his A when you can carry the pelvis? Yeah, man, it's, it's out of control. So hopefully he's Oh, we back can say soon, ass man, on, but... on, on our show. Shh. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've said a lot worse, but no doubt about it. But you know, yes, Anthony Davis struggling, struggling, struggling to stay healthy. This means DMC now has to carry load. Rondo, Drew Holiday, all those guys now to kind of pick it up if he's going to be out for a significant amount of time, which I really do think he's going to miss a couple weeks here with this. Definitely. So once again, man, awesome show. 
as always, man, and I can't say enough about having our man Clipper Darrow on board with us here on the Baseline NBA podcast to break down the state of affairs for the Los Angeles Clippers. Uh, we definitely look forward to him and his crew rolling out some awesome shows moving forward on Dash Radio. For the Baseline, Cal Lee, Warren Shaw, we appreciate you guys, each and every single one of you, and we'll catch up with you next time.